The Amazing Equal Pay Show was made by the London Women's Film Group and coincides with the Equal Pay Act, which comes into effect this year. The Women's Film Group is part of the London Women's Liberation Workshop and is just one of hundreds of groups in the women's movement in the country. Until fairly recently, the number of films made by women was relatively small, and this has meant that the way women are shown in film and on television has largely been the way men think they are or the way they would like them to be. So one of the fundamental reasons for the existence of the film group is to make films for women by women who are involved in the same everyday experiences and who are part of the same struggle. What we did is we've all rotated the jobs on the making of this um, equal pay film and those who knew how to do things passed on their knowledge to the other members of the group and we now can all do all the various technical things that are needed in filmmaking. Um, we've had to do this because in the industry there's no training for women in these technical things. Another important aspect of our work has been to try to work collectively. Um, the film industry is organised in a very hierarchical way and with a very strict division of labour. This means that there's a whole army of people doing very menial tasks. The technicians are used as technicians and have very little um, involvement with the film, sort of before or after their particular part of the process. Um, on the Equal Pay film, um, we've all been involved in shooting it, we've all recorded, we've all been involved in editing it, and we've discussed the shooting script amongst the whole group before we've shot each scene. Um, another reason for forming the film group was that we didn't wish to exclude any women um, from making films who wish to do so. And, um, but at the same time, some of us do make our living in the industry and have been able to organize with other women in the industry to try and make the union represent us as women, which they haven't done in the past. We now have eight films in distribution which are shown in a very wide variety of contexts. But we feel very strongly that our job doesn't end when the film is completed. And we're particularly interested in going around with our films to talk to audiences about the political and aesthetic implications of the films. Um, for instance, the Equal Pay film, we're very keen on um, actually trying to show the films in quite different contexts, such as uh, housing estates um, and factories. The next extract you're going to see is um, a scene in which um, the working mother, who is the focal point of our film, um, talks about her life. And uh, this is followed by a scene with mystifying Marvo, the ringmaster of the capitalist circus, and his bunny girl assistant, Poodle, who is woman as sex object. Oh, God, what a day I've had. Well, you know what it's like, don't you? I mean, getting up at seven every morning it really tires me out. My husband's so awful in the morning. I have to bring him a cup of tea and wake him up a few times before he'll get up. Then there's the kids. Well, they're not old enough yet to dress themselves, so I've got to dress them. And my husband always starts complaining in the middle. Where's my shirt? Where's my socks? I wash his shirts, I iron them, and I put them in the bottom drawer. But he can never find them. He doesn't like his job. Well then, neither do I. Because I've got to get to work. It's not just down the road for me. I've got to get on the buses and there's all the traffic and waiting at the queues. I mean, I never get to work on time. But I tell them every morning. I mean, I've got to get the kids off before I get to work. Of course, they don't understand. They're all men. They've got somebody doing the same sort of thing for them, haven't they? Can't say I like work. Well, shuffling bits of paper around all day taking messages here and there, making cups of tea. Why can't they make their own tea for a change? But I can't say I'd do it if it wasn't for the extra ten pounds we have to bring in. We just couldn't do without it. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, I get this little voice in me. 
that says, I'm not going to get up today. No, I'm not going to get up. And then I lay and think about all the things I might do if I had a day to myself. You're not taken in by that sob story, are you? The workers in this country are better off than they've ever been. You don't want to worry your pretty little head about it. I take care of that side of things. Now come along, Poodle. Flash it with a leg and wagger your bum and cheer us all up. Come on, let's have a bit of tits and teeth. What do we do without you after all? You're every man's dream. You're the incentive for them all to go on working. Esther and I were part of the original street theatre group who um, originally uh, performed this play and I played the part of Poodle. One of the things we wanted to do in the film was to look at the different ways in which women are divided and set against each other. A woman who's admired for her beauty as a sex object probably doesn't feel any sense of solidarity with other women. She'll regard them more as competitors. Classing women as trivial-minded and childish makes it easier to put them down. We wanted to contrast the treatment of women as playthings with the hard work and responsibility faced by most women in society. Housework is unpaid and unglamorous, and it's a reality, which, like looking after small kids, isn't recognised as real work. And here again, women can come to believe that this isn't really work, however tired they feel. The isolation and strain of trying to fulfil two roles as glamour puss and homemaker leads many women to feel inadequate and desperate, to drink secretly or survive by swallowing tranquilizers. Women working outside the home aren't treated much better. It's assumed that they're working simply for pin money. Women must help each other to regain their self-confidence and no longer allow themselves to be used by the bosses for the worst paid and most monotonous jobs in industry. Esther? Women in industry and the professions are hung up, tired out and fed up with the trade union bosses, both male and female, abusing them as cannon fodder in the management techniques of job grading and job evaluation. We're tired of being told that we're not equal to other workers when every hour of blood, sweat and boring repetitive jobs screams out for compensation. We know the qualified and the trained are only qualified and trained at the expense of our taxes and our low-paid jobs, and yet this is never recognised. Yes, and I think the Equal Pay film shows very clearly that, in fact, women, if they really want to get equal pay, are going to have to fight every inch of the way. For instance, uh, the Equal Pay Act, which is going to be phased in finally this year, is not, in fact, going to really change women's position in industry. They're still going to be seen as um, a pool of cheap labour. Uh, one of the major anomalies of the Act is that it doesn't deal with women's work. And as most women actually do work in sexual ghettos, this is, in fact, a major anomaly. Another very important point is that there is very substantial evidence to suggest that um, employers are evading the Act by actually regrading women, which means that they can still get lower pay than men. So all in all, um, this Act and the anti-discrimination legislation that's coming in shortly will do very little to change women's position. Women usually find that they have to organise on their own because of men's attitudes. For instance, we often find ourselves arguing with a union as well as with employers. The next film ex extract deals with men's attitude to women's demands. Right then, can I have everyone's attention? You all know what we're here for, don't you? Yeah. What happened at the meeting? Yeah, go on, tell us what happened. The men got their pay rise. How much? 5%. Well, where does that leave us? Same as 
before, still with a 20% differential. But what about our proposal? But what about equal pay? I tried, I can't get anything more out of him. So I think the only thing we can do is to strike. And I've asked Bob Smith, our convener, to come along and tell us what sort of support we can expect from the men. Bob? Thank you, Alan. Girls, I don't know about equal pay, but I'll, I'll help you get organised for strike action. Help us get organised for strike action? We want support. Support? Support for what? Equal pay, of course. Yeah. yeah. Equal pay? Equal pay with you lot? You must be joking. Blimey, you're only getting ten or a week. We know. We want equal pay. That's what we're coming out on strike for, and we're not accepting anything less, are we? Yeah. Now look here, girl. Stop rocking a boat. You ain't King Canoe, oh. nor Queen Canoe. And I've got problems here. Oh. But you've got to see it my way. I'm the convener here of five unions. And I'm up to hell in trouble with them. I've got AUEW fighting with Astoms. I've got Apex fighting with TNG. And GNM don't even ask me about that. Blimey. On top of that, you're asking about equal pay? That's yeah. right. I must be joking. The lads had never listened to me. They want more pay, not less. Well, so do we. Right, girls, well, we're going to have to organise our strike ourselves. Yes. Yeah. We supported the men when they were on strike. Very well did. But when it comes to the crunch, you can just see what sort of support you can expect from the men. Right, mate, we're going to stop your production line. Yeah, that's the right. The women at Dagenham did it, so can we. Let's have a big hand for the solidarity of women. <laughs> Listen, you lot, you're not equal, and nothing's going to alter yeah, that. You don't really think that you do work at the same value as we do. When you can do the heavy work and have the same qualifications that we've got, maybe I'll come back and talk to you. Yeah, I'd like to see you lugging 50 pounds of washing back from the laundrette. Talk about yeah. heavy work. Come on, then, let's get back to the matter in hand. Now, what we want is the rate for the jobs. To do it, we've got to go on strike, whether we get solidarity from the men or not. Are you with me? Yeah. Strike, girls, strike for better wages. Strike, girls, strike for better pay. Go on fighting for what's yours. Don't be tempted from the cause. Go on fighting till the bosses they give way. Right. So we need another meeting in order to get organised. What about right now? If we stay on another hour, we could get the whole thing tied up. We're striking on Monday, don't forget. Oh, Helen, I can't possibly stay another hour. We've been here an hour. Well, you already. see, Tom's been minding the out. kids for two hours and he's got a union meeting tonight, so he can't possibly... Look, let this be your night for once. We've got a strike on our hands, don't forget. Oh, look, it's all right for you. You don't have kids. You just don't understand. I mean, we've got to spend time with our families, haven't we? Look, just because I'm not married doesn't mean I don't have interests of my own or a life outside this factory. But sometimes some things are more important than others. Come on, what's going on here? Most trade unions at the moment are run by men for men, and women's needs are secondary. Union meetings are intimidating, usually at inconvenient times and without childcare facilities. Women's demands are usually only dealt with if there's time. The men see nationalisation, redundancy and wage claims as the real meat of union activity. They are important, but women's particular demands are also important. When some of us tried to organise in the ACTT, the Film Technicians Union, around discrimination against women, 
We found the union could hardly give us any information at all about women. <clears throat> and so we decided to try to get a paid researcher to investigate discrimination appointed. And although we met a lot with a lot of resistance along the way, we finally got the appointment. And I'd just like to say that we think it would be very important if other women in other industries could try to get the same appointment made so that we could begin to build up a picture of how discrimination works and how it benefits the employers. Sarah Benton got the job as paid researcher and she's just finished a very long, very detailed report about discrimination. Less than 15% of ACTT's members are women. This proportion has been dropping for the last 20 years, early since the war when there were many more opportunities for women both to work in the wide variety of technical grades that exist in the industry and the top production directing grades. Now we have a situation where women are confined to very few areas. They tend either to work in the secretarial based jobs uh, in film and television and the laboratories or to work in the, the less skilled and the lower paid jobs in the laboratories. Um, it creates a se situation of a sexual ghetto in the industry. Apart from editing, less than 1% of the technicians in the industry are women. The reason for this, employers say, is because firstly the equipment is too heavy. This isn't true any longer because the equipment is getting constantly lighter. The second reason, they say, is women never apply. Again, this isn't true, quite a lot of women do apply, but they find either there's a straightforward refusal to consider them for the job, or that they don't have the technical knowledge to work in these areas. Well, despite what Sarah says, people who don't work in the film industry have a lot of illusions about what it entails. They think that we spend our time meeting film stars and so on. Whereas actually, for most of us, um, they're very tough jobs that often entail a lot of compulsory overtime, which we're supposed to do out of dedication to film. That is the particular kind of blackmail that employers in the film industry use. Um, Maisie and Olive, for instance, use, uh, work in the laboratories um, and can tell us a bit about their experience as women there. I have worked in the laboratory now for the last 26 years and only in that, my experience, only two people have attained top grade. Um, we aren't allowed to, um, through management or union, they are apathetic about it. Um, I think that our union could encourage us much more to um, get on in the field, you know. Um, Olive has obviously got some comments on that, haven't you, dear? Well, I find that in a lot of cases, women's minds are conditioned to the fact that only men do the specified jobs. Uh, of course, we all did men's jobs during the war, and women are, are very capable of these highly skilled jobs and it was proven then, so why not now? Is there anything you actually can't do because you're women? Well, we're not allowed to do printing and developing, which is done by the men on shift work. And uh, as I was told, all sorts of things go on if men and women get together on shift work, so <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Um, Marilyn works in another exclusively female part of the industry, which is secretarial work, without which the whole industry would collapse, I'm sure. Well, I think that women in broadcasting are terribly oppressed, particularly secretaries. When I was on the BBC training course back in 1971, we were told by a man who was a head of department that we would never make the grade as director general of the BBC. This job was only open for men. We would probably make it to his secretary, though. Another aspect of women in broadcasting that is terribly sexist is the glamour aspect. As part of our course, we were given lectures in flower arranging, makeup and good grooming for the office, how to prepare and serve food and drinks for office visitors. In short, we were given all the useless information that would make us into decorative sex objects, pounding a typewriter in the background, while the men we were servicing were rushing around doing the big broadcasting jobs and getting their names on the credits. Anyway, as the upshot of all this, I was eventually given a job as secretary to an engineer in the transmitter department. Well, I think what Marilyn says proves what, again, Sarah, is a point that Sarah brings out in the report, that many women find themselves doing housework on the job. That is to say, they end up um, 
being cleaner, cook, substitute wife and mother and giving emotional support in what is a highly charged emotional situation, the procedure of making a film. And they're not paid for all this extra work. Um, some women in a mental health center in New York have uh, organized um, facing the same kind of situation and they have refused to do this extra work which they're not paid for and um, which all women are expected to do because um, the housework that all women do at home is not waged. Um, and I think that now that we are aware and have made the industry aware that there is discrimination and we have a report, we must go a step further and organize wherever we are in whatever jobs. One thing we could do is to organize um, a day conference with women in all grades, even canteen staff and cleaners. Um, and anybody who's interested in such a conference could perhaps get in touch with us. It's said that in the industry, um, women don't just don't apply for technical grades. And also that if they did apply, they couldn't do a lot of the work. For instance, they couldn't do camera work because it involves carrying heavy cameras around. Well, women carry heavy babies around, and they carry heavy washing around. And women have been known to carry heavy cameras around very successfully. In fact, I know a woman who shot a feature film handheld camera. So that just isn't true. And about women applying for technical jobs, the fact that they don't apply, or that it's said that they don't apply, isn't true either. And Fran will tell you her story of what happened when she applied. Yeah, I applied to the BBC some time ago to be a trainee camera operator. I had a letter back explaining that I couldn't do this because I, w I was a woman. Uh, when I questioned them further, again, we came back to the thing that the work was too arduous for women and the equipment was too heavy. So I passed on the correspondence to the union to see what their attitude would be. Um, in this case, it was very much the same as the employers, and uh, this is a bit of a letter I got back. Um, there are, of course, certain occasions in which it might be physically impossible for most women to carry out the work concerned, so they were not prepared to sort of take up that case against the BBC. In a situation in which men dominate the film industry and women only perform largely supportive or routine functions, it's hardly surprising that the image that we are bombarded with daily on the media bears little or no relationship to women's need or aspirations. In fact, that the image of woman is essentially one generated by male fantasy. Um, it, we feel that it's our, it's our task to actually transform this image as a film group. And uh, as a comment on the way women are actually presented on the media, and indeed the way strikers are presented on the media, we leave you with a final extract from our film in which our male fantasy housewife, Mrs. Normal Opinion, um, prompted by the mystifying Marvo, um, gives a television interview. Come on, Poodle, this is your chance. You've always wanted to be famous, and now thousands of people are going to see you on television. Demonstrations. Strikes militant agitators. Is there something rotten in the state of British industry? To find the answer to these vital questions, we asked a representative sample of the general public to come into the studio and give their views. Just what does the woman in the market think? Just what are the, the feelings she has regarding industrial strife? Oh. Now, uh, Mrs. Uh, normal Opinion, you, I would say, are a, uh, a typical housewife. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I try to be. What is your opinion, then, of uh, strikes? Of workers who uh, hold the country to ransom? Well, uh, my, my opinion is that these workers are just holding the country to ransom. And as a typical housewife, what is your feeling about rising prices? What is your real purchasing power? For example, are you tightening the purse strings of your weekly budget? Shouldn't every housewife fight her own 
battle of the shopping basket. Become uh, a policeman in judging prices. It's uh, terrible. I mean, things are going up all the time. Yeah, who is to blame, though? Can we afford as a nation to go on meeting these inflationary wage demands? How can a sensible policy be generated in the white heat of industrial relations? Uh, well, uh, it, it's got to stop somewhere, hasn't it? Yes, yes, but where do we confront this situation? Must we as a nation resort to tougher measures with the union bosses? Well, really, it all boils down to greed, doesn't it? Greed? Now, there's a word to conjure with. Uh, I mean, it, it's human nature, isn't it? I mean, you're never going to change that. These workers are greedy, yes, yes. and they all want more yes. all the time. Yes, and yes, well, um... Me. We what do time? have to stop now, I'm afraid, as we are running out of time. Thank you very much, Mrs. Lapinion. And we'll be back again after the commercials when we'll be taking you behind the scenes to see just what does make women strikers tick. <laughs> deserve a little luxury. It's a new kind of excitement. Silky, smooth finish. Vulva, the car of tomorrow, tonight. How did I do? You were positively pulsating, Poogle. You've got a starry future ahead of you. Now, let's go and put the finishing touches to that con trick I was telling you about. You remember the one where I blindfold the workers by calling them brother, chain them all down and make them promise no bother. Oh, yes, I remember. You mean the social contract. Oh, sister, don't you weep, don't you moan. 